burn down. Welcome, Pathfinders, to the Find the Path podcast's actual play of the Hell's Rebels Adventure Path, episode one. Dun, dun, yeah. dun. So uh, I am your host, and I will be your game master for this, Rick Sandage, for those of you familiar with me from our Mummy's Mask or Tyrant's Grasp actual plays. For those of you not familiar with me, welcome. My name is Rick. I am joined by the greatest team in the history of Pathfinder, Miss Jessica praise. Jenkins. That's me. <laughs> Jordan <laughs> Jenkins. No relation. Heather Allen, Aww. Rachel Sandage, Woot. and Ross Scoggin. Wait, I'm part of this too you're yeah. part of this yes. also ross, yes. is here. ross hey. joins us <laughs> so we are find the path adventures we are an officially licensed partner with paizo incorporated playing through currently now three different pathfinder adventure paths mummy's mask on our find the path podcast tyrant's grasp on our patreon exclusive rss feed and now hell's rebels so I think we'll just hit the ground running. I believe that's what we actually did with Tyrant's Grasp. And so uh, that seemed to work out pretty well. So um, Yeah, not for the characters. Not for the characters. <laughs> we'll see if it's quite as tragic here. We are doing this in second edition. We're taking a first edition of Path and converting it to second edition. Uh, in large part because we, we are recording this in the year 2020, although it's actually releasing in the year 2021. And... As such, there are very few second edition adventure paths out right now. And instead of eating into the ones that you could be playing, we decided to go and revisit a game that would be less likely for you to delve into. Mm -hmm. uh, and also a story that I've been very excited to do for a long time. That being the Tale of Hell's Rebels. So I guess let's go ahead and just get this started, shall we? Let's All start. Right. Yeah. Yes. All right. Now, traditionally, this would be the part where I tell everyone to roll for initiative. There is not initiative in second edition, so I am not telling you that. I get to choose. Uh oh. <laughs> Rude. Goodness. I don't like it. Right. Like we we stripped rolling. away from us live on air. <laughs> no, nope, now I've got all my own power. Uh -oh. Next, you'll be telling us we're doing secret rolls. Uh, no one break that to Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just kidding. They told me. Should have done well that before. Advance. So I suppose let's go ahead and begin. Let's begin with a little bit of background, shall we? A little over a hundred years ago, Aridin, the god of humanity and patron deity of the nation of Chiliax, died. Oops. Spoiler. <laughs> 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 this sudden loss fractured the nation of Chiliax and led to a civil war that turned brother against brother and threatened to destroy the mighty nation. Decades passed as the nobles and their armies fought for control of the nation, and the common people became increasingly desperate for an end to the conflict. After 40 years of war, the head of the noble house of Thrun, Abigail I, signed a pact with Asmodeus, the Prince of Hell. She pledged herself, her family, and her nation in service to Hell in exchange for the aid that she would need to end the war. Hell obliged, and with a legion of devils at her command, Abigail Thrun soon defeated her opposition and became the first ruler of Infernal Chiliax. The people of Chiliax, so tired of the decades of senseless bloodshed, quickly accepted this new rule, as it at least brought some stability to their day-to-day -day lives. Some stood in opposition of House Thrun, but were soon crushed by the thrice-damned House, and for 75 years, House Thrun has ruled Chiliax with an iron fist. But the cracks are beginning to show. In the heartland of Chiliax, an army of crusaders marches against the powers of hell controlling the nation. And in response, House Thrun has declared martial law and has started consolidating their power. Far away from this front, beyond the Minador Mountains that separate central Chiliax from its northern province of Ravenel, stands the silver city of Kintargo a metropolitan haven for artists and free thinkers at the outer edge of Chilish rule. All, however, is not well in Cantargo these days, as House Thrun has implemented martial law, and the previous Lord Mayor of the city is now missing, and has been replaced by the Asmodean Inquisitor, Brazili Thrun. So, the stage is set, our villains are in place, our heroes wait in the wings, and let the story begin. Kintargo is a large metropolitan city. 
A sprawling city built across three hills, two on a central island in the middle of the mouth of the river. The uh, ridiculously difficult to pronounce river. Hold on one second. <laughs> the Yalubalus River. It's Hobgoblin, by the way, in case you're wondering about the <laughs> etymology of Yalubalus. <laughs> I love it. Two of those hills stand on the island, one hill on the mainland. The city split in two by the river with a single arching bridge, bleak bridge, connecting the two halves of the city. Here on these three hills, forming the skyline of the city, are the seat of government in the form of Castle Cantargo, the seat of faith, once the Temple of Aroden, now the Grand Temple of Asmodeus, and then on the far hill, the seat of education, Alabaster Academy. However, we're not starting with any of those. Instead, we start on Bleak Bridge. Late in the afternoon, crowds of passerbys make their way across the bridge, a bridge that is wide enough for four carts to make their way abreast across. Along the edge of Bleak Bridge are built numerous houses built into the bridge itself, clinging to the side of the structure and raised up above it. Small, thin houses often with small gardens behind them, shops on the ground floor, homes above. As we begin, we find ourselves in a small shop outside of the somewhat dusty window, not dusty from lack of care, but dusty from the amount of dirt kicked up from the bridge and the horses passing outside. Yeah, foot traffic. Outside, you can see a small sign swinging gently in the breeze of what could be a mermaid but again, the sign is so old and weathered that it's difficult to tell. However, in bright painted letters underneath it are the words, See Witch Glass. Inside is what looks to be a clumsy man's nightmare. A shop <laughs> filled of so many breakable objects on so many <laughs> precarious shelves that they seem to almost lean down all around one as you make your way in. Wind chimes sit there and softly cling in an almost non-existent breeze. Various vials and filters line the surrounding walls in colors of green and blue and gold and silver. Tables containing a variety of artisanal goods of a variety of accomplishment. It seems like even the least skilled or most accidental creation here is still given a place of prominence, as if giving the art piece a chance to find a home, even if it's slightly lopsided. <laughs> a single woman is in the shop. Jessica, would you like to describe this character? I will. I'm already excited. This is Adria Marcella Seal. Adria has long, dark blue hair, almost like the deep part of the ocean kind of blue and slightly pointed ears that almost look like fins. Uh, she's half elf, but not of the typical elf <laughs> variety. She's a woman who, if she were human, would look in maybe her mid forties, almost 50. Uh, she's kind of heavy set from years of, of motherhood and kind of putting other people first. She stands around nine or nine feet tall. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Holy crap. Nine feet tall. She Good stands... gracious. She's amazingly graceful to work in the shop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You'd have to be. Yeah. No. <laughs> she's secretly she a minotaur. She stands around five nine. Very well. So she's pretty tall, but she's not towering. She kind of has, you know, lightly tanned skin uh, with almost like a bluish undertone. And she's wearing essentially a clean layered dress in blues and greens. And the only jewelry she really wears is a very old wedding band that's uh, gold. And it looks like it's she's been wearing it for a couple decades now. And I suppose she's heading over to, uh, to close up shop because it's it's late afternoon and about time to start dinner yeah just out of curiosity left hand or right hand for the wedding band left okay so she's right handed. That... widows and widowers wear their wedding mm -hmm. band on the right hand oh okay. yeah then right <laughs> <laughs> so adria you make your way through the shop getting ready to close up for the day putting out the few candles that you've lit it has not been a busy day mm. But as you look out the window, you can see people rushing about their business, trying to get home. Leaning forward, looking out the window, you can see to the north, you can see that the sky has turned gray. 
and half the sky like a blanket slowly being dragged over the city is turning from blue to gray as the storm rolls in. Hmm. Storm. The air smells like the ocean just before the storm hits. This beautiful scent that washes away the smell of horses and carts and people. As you're distracted, you only notice at the last moment as the chime over your door rings, the door swinging open with some force. Although you've had enough experience over the years to know where and where not to put breakable glass things in proximity to your door. Yeah, definitely not there. As you look over your shoulder, you see two children rushing in. A girl, you'd say 13 or 14, and a younger boy of 10 or 11. You immediately recognize the children, as both of them live further down the street. The girl being Narina and the boy Terzo, her younger brother. Mm. Narina holds her brother somewhat as he seems to be... Not limping so much as bent double over. Oh, kiddos, what happened? Missila, it's Terzo, can you... She brings the boy forward, lifting up the side of his shirt, showing this already darkening bruise across the boy's left side. Well, yeah, of course, what happened? We we were playing out near the street. She gestures over. Terzo has that look of a of a 10 or 11 year old boy trying to be tough as his chin quivers a little bit and you can see the tears kind of welling in the edges of his eyes, Mm. but he refuses to let them out. Mm. His sister rushes her over, settles him down. We we were out in, in the street, there was a commotion and he rushed forward to see what it was. As you look over, Go ahead and uh, let's let's get the first roll of the game out of the way. Go ahead and make me a medicine check as you look Ooh, the boy's oh, injury dang. over. Fancy. Okay. All right. Not a great first roll. I rolled a three for a ten. Well, the good news is, <laughs> as you look this over, you can tell you're going to guess that this is probably a kick or at least a glancing blow from a horse. This is definitely bruised, hmm. but you don't think that the ribs are likely cracked or broken. Uh, He is definitely going to feel this tomorrow. Okay, well, I don't think it's going to be... I don't think you got anything broken in there, but, like, I can make you up a poultice. So uh, just sit tight. I got to go grab my stuff, you know. There's a chime as the door opens again. Oh. Uh, A figure, his shadow and silhouette from the light outside, steps through the doorway. A second man comes in behind. For just a moment, you feel this panic as if some form of devil has walked through your door. Mm. Then the Hell Knight removes his helmet, tucks it under his arm. The man's face is scarred along the right-hand side. His hair is shorn, almost to the point of being entirely bald. He looks over you with steely eyes. Both the boy and the girl, the boy hops off of the stool that you'd set him on. The boy literally grabs your skirt to hide behind. The girl more slides behind you. Uh, can I help you? Good afternoon, ma'am. Afternoon. We saw two children running here. Oh, yeah, they're neighborhood kids. The boy ran in front of my horse. He spooked her. Is he all right? Uh, yeah, it looks like he's going to be okay, a little bruised. He looks past you towards the boy who shakes from behind your skirt. Boy. One should be cautious when interfering with a Hell Knight on his duty. You are fortunate that we are not immediately needed. The boy looks up nervously between you. I just wanted to see the knights. You wanted to see the knights. We are not the Order of the Torrent, boy. The time of those Hell Knights has passed. We are the Order of the Rack. We do not take the time to pose and play with children. He leans slightly forward. You should pray that you never see the Order of the Rack. You know, I'll have a, I'll have a stern talking to him, like, it won't happen again, you know, but we are closing up. So, you know, if you don't want, if you don't need anything with me or with us, you know, thanks for checking on the kid. Uh, you know, sorry to bother you. I apologize for keeping you late, ma'am. No worries. Thank you for your time. Of course, any time. He gives another stern glance down towards the boy, the other Hell Knight opening the door and stepping back out. The man turns to leave, gets to the door, pauses and looks around. 
Where is your portrait of Queen Throne? It ain't hung up there? Huh. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I actually read our prep for this, and I know that that's a bad thing. <laughs> you are then aware of Brazili Throne's Proclamation the Second. Of course. I make sure I read every new one, you know. Got to make sure you're up to code. That is responsible of you, citizen. I am required to inform you that you will need to hang a portrait measuring no less than 17 by 11 inches. You have three days to comply. Thank you for the, for the, the information. There will be a new proclamation coming soon. You should be aware of that one as well. Do I need a bigger portrait? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe she, you know. A faint smile cracks the edge of his face. <laughs> it wouldn't hurt. Okay. He then turns, places his helmet back on top of his head, and for a moment you see this black armored spiked silhouette of the Hell Knight as he marches out. And then as the door shuts, it almost feels like the room becomes literally lighter. The boy bursts into tears. As soon as he's gone, I'm going to walk over and like lock the door, make sure the closed sign is facing the <laughs> Turn right the way. side around. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be like, all right, Torzo, like, look, I got some cookies. Like, come on upstairs. I'll get you fixed up. Don't worry about those hell knights. Okay. You know, they talk real big game, but like at it's the end really of the day, mean. they still just knights. He nods. His sister watches out the window as the knights mount this look of now that they're not in the same room with her, this perturbed anger. Come on, have some cookies while I fix your brother up. I suppose you give the two of them cookies. Make your mm -hmm. way out to your garden. Collect some clove to make a poultice to, at the very least, topically help with the pain. Yeah. The two children, thank you. The boy threw another, like, his fifth cookie in his mouth. <laughs> <laughs> I take care. Uh, send my love to your mother. You walk them to the door. They wave as they rush their way off down the street. As you step out, you can feel this cool breeze coming off the ocean. Looks like a storm's coming. You turn and make your way back in. As you enter your house, there's this distant peal of thunder announcing the arrival of the storm. Across the city, as you are on Bleak Bridge between the two halves of the city, north from where you are, stands the towering Alabaster Academy. On its southeast tower, six floors up, stands a classroom, semicircular in shape. Desks three rows deep, six wide, all facing towards a slightly raised dais along the curved outside wall. A mahogany desk sits in front of a wide bay window that overlooks the city, staring off towards the south, towards the main portion of the city itself. The thunder rolls in through the walls and causes a couple of the students to glance out towards the window and away from their professor. A man stands in front of the desk, having just finished his lecture. Long, uh, what's the, what's the term? We have two teachers here. What's the term for the long pointy stick that you point at maps with? Is there a, a term for it? Is it just a pointer? I call it a pointer. <laughs> pointer. <laughs> So a three-foot pointer slowly lowering down from where he was gesturing at a 1,500-year-old map of the inner sea. Heather, would you like to describe this character? My character is uh, Cesare Nightbloom. He is an elf. He's tall, <laughs> standing at about six foot five with the normal slender elvish build. Um, he has pale skin and bright golden eyes that almost seem to gleam in the light. His hair is black and it's shaved pretty close on the right side, but the left side is longer, falling down to his shoulder. He's fairly handsome, but he usually has a pretty stern expression. He's got to keep those students in line after all. <laughs> he would be wearing a uh, pair of uh, pants and a white shirt with a cravat with a purple vest right now. Probably a coat draped across the chair behind the desk. But I suppose you lower your pointing stick. Yep. Pointer. Pointer. Mm -hmm. 
It's a pointy stick. It's a pointy <laughs> stick. Wait, it's it's pointy not a weapon, stick though. Just we can't sound say it's pointy. Is... Ooh, it is a weapon. It's like a walking cane, but it's a pointer. <laughs> oh, okay, right. no, 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 wait. It's the pointing stick. It's also the switch if they're rude. <laughs> Release the tiger. It's mean, usually for younger <laughs> students. I'm assuming these are older students, like in their teens at least. They're all so university be, students. Yeah. Oh, so, so, okay, yeah. sorry. Right, these I, are yeah. only for geniuses I didn't know what that kind of graduated we were talking about here. <laughs> you lower your pointer. The blackboard that takes up one portion of the far wall is covered with elegant writing that states, Kionin's refudiation of Taldor's beseechment for aid during the Shining Crusade. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Fun time. Very what exciting. a great topic. Got a the regular Professor not. Benz in here. <laughs> he turns, glancing over the class. In closing, that is... Why the elves refused Kaldor's call for aid during the Shining Crusade. A few of the students jot down some notes. One girl raises her hand. Professor Nightbloom. Yes, Miss Altamara. Shouldn't... Shouldn't they have wanted to help? The Crusaders were fighting the undead, which are a threat to all life. They're pure evil, and so... Isn't it short-sighted to assume that while your neighbors are fighting, that that won't eventually come to your door? Well, you must remember that Kionan does not share a border with Ustalov. The elves did not feel like it was something they should get involved with. Another student raises his hand. <laughs> Mr. Gaspari. So they chose to remain neutral. It wasn't an immediate threat to them. So it makes perfect sense that they didn't get involved, as they actually didn't have any skin in the game, unlike Taldor or the dwarves. He glances over towards the other student, looks back towards you. If Taldor had lost, they could have just negotiated with the tyrant. And that is a possibility, though, from our previous lessons, you should remember that the elves are less than inclined to negotiate with evil. I would like to think that if the tyrant had gotten close to Kionan's borders, that the elves would have eventually involved themselves, but that's all conjecture. This happened some 1,500 years ago, after all. A third student starts to raise their hand, at which Jeez, point you kids. hear the distant <laughs> bell ringing through the courtyard below. He lowers his hand, and there's the immediate scraping sound of 16 desk chairs. Don't forget your assignments are due next class. There's a lot of nods. One or two students make their way by to hand over late paperwork that they were supposed to have delivered last class period. <laughs> <laughs> and that student was me. No. <laughs> they make their way out through the door past the newly hung portrait of Queen Abigail the Third. Second, yeah. second, second, second. Oh, no, Queen second. Oh, Jeez, we're we're third. Third. Wait, we don't need another one right now. <laughs> you have a long moment to watch them go. Cesare starts gathering his papers and to grade later. As you begin to pack up, you hear the soft tink, tink sound of raindrops striking the window behind your desk. There's then a scraping sound and some mutters or shouts from the front of your classroom as the door opens up and five students make their way in. Three of them are tall boys. Each of them wears a red armband wrapped around one of their arms, mm. displaying the cross insignia. You immediately recognize them as members of the Chelish Citizens Group. A number of citizens, you guess patriots would be the proper term, forming what in essence amounts to militias responsible for patrolling where the Datari can't and reporting people in for insurrection or any negative thoughts pertaining towards the new Lord Mayor and the established throne rule. The two students being dragged in between them are younger classmates. As they pull them in, one of them, the biggest, biggest and burliest of them, has one of them in a headlock and drags them in. The other one is being dragged between the other two and stumbles before spilling a stack of flyers. <sighs> Seemingly a call Ooh. to a protest across the floor. What exactly is going on here? Cesare steps forward, 
let go of him and motions towards the one student that's got the one in the headlock. He releases him with a bit of a shove to the point that he falls somewhat into one of the desks next to him. That was uncalled for. Sorry, Professor. I'm sure you are. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, we're getting a saucy character out of here this time. (laughs) Help the one student up. (laughs) You help the boy up. He doesn't seem to be injured, although his shirt is torn in one place. The other two release the other student as well. I can assure you that there is no need for violence. They tried to run. They were posting flyers out in the hallway and trying to hand them out. He picks up one of the flyers and almost shoves it in your face. Look at this. Cesare takes it. This is treason. That disapproving teacher look on his face. (laughs) Uh, You wouldn't really call this treasonous. All it is is a flyer saying... Let your voice be heard. Come to the protest in front of the Opera House tomorrow at Aria Park. Starts at dawn. Band to perform. (laughs) Wait, what? Band to perform? Who's playing? I do not think this is treason. Seems just like a flyer for a concert. Regardless, I will talk to these students. The three look between each other. The biggest boy nods. Yes, Professor. He gestures a hand as his two underlings follow him out. The other two students dust themselves off. The young man with the torn shirt nods his head. Thank thank you, Professor. Cesare closes the classroom door. You need to be more careful. Mm, Perhaps not hand these out on school property. I just... I know what people are saying behind closed doors. I just want them to say it where it matters. I understand, but you can't... Well, you see how other people's opinions are varying right now. The boy nods. Mayhap just uh, leave a stack where people might see it in one of the common rooms. Yes, Professor. Cesare helps them gather their flyers... Now, they either head home or head back to your dormitory. They nod, exit out. By this point, there's a steady sound of fat raindrops striking your windowsill. Again, you have a rather lofty view from up here on the sixth floor, since mm-hmm. all the old professors don't want to climb the stairs, so they give mm-hmm. it to the near mortal elf. Cardio. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Cesare watches them and make sure they at least get out of the hallway his classroom is in safely. Yeah, you (laughs) You stand at the door, watch them get down to the end. The other three students weren't waiting to jump them in the hallway, so. He would return to his desk, continue gathering up the last of his things. As you turn back and you make your way back to the desk, you hear a crunch and look down to see the crumpled up flyer. He picks it up, folds it, puts it in his pocket. As you get back to your desk, there's a small shadow that separates from the darkness under your chair. You feel a bump as the furry creature rubs against your leg before the feline hops gracefully up on top of the desk. Kitty! Bored with today's lecture, were you? I'm usually sleeping. Cesare pats her head. But that was interesting. The cat turns and looks back in the direction of the door before back towards you. I have a question for you, Professor. I had plenty of questions today, Raven. She folds her paws in front of her and stares up. Cesare rolls his eyes. (laughs) How long will it be before you can no longer sit by and watch the growing threat? Sometimes I think perhaps we have waited too long already. He would look out the window towards the temple of Asmodeus. You see a clear view of the temple. There's a sound of thunder and another fork of lightning splits the sky. He pats his shoulder, motioning for Raven to jump up. Yep, she does so. I think perhaps we have a rally to attend tomorrow. You just hear a soft purr of acknowledgement. As the fork of lightning cuts the sky, we see a large gothic cathedral the angelic statues that once lined the outside of the structure gone replaced now by a variety of irones and bearded devils 
that loom down like gargoyles from above. The rain has started, but it is not falling in full yet. Just spurts of rain. Just enough that a small dribble comes out of the mouth of some of these gargoyle statues. A number of umbrellas circle around an open grave in the shadow of this church. The graveyard spiraling around the outside of the building up here on the hill. Those mourners, almost without exception, are tiflings. Men and women standing around and listening to a priestess, a human in her case, reading a eulogy over the open grave. A man stands back from the crowd, one hand lowered down, holding the hand of an elderly halfling woman. Ross, would you care to describe your character? Yeah, Niccolo is a tall, strapping man of his uh, late 20s in apparent age, though probably in real age as well, as he appears more human than anything um, as far as ancestry is concerned, with a mop of black hair that seems to resist virtually any form of styling. He shares a, a skin tone with the rest of the tieflings, and his eyes are a deep brown that almost seem to reflect a light that's not there sometimes. A single vertical scar lays over his left eye, and you can tell that his eyes are sunken, um, as if though he probably suffers from some form of insomnia. Two slightly forward curved uh, horns protrude from his forehead, and he does in fact have a tail that ends in a barb. He wears gray homespun clothes and black slacks, as well as a black cloth vest and leather boots. Nicola, you stand here listening to the end of the eulogy. The priestess of Shalen finishes her eulogy, pulls out a small flute, and plays a few quick notes that sound like birdsong. She then lowers her head and simply states, Soraya Cooper. The crowd echoes the name of the dead. Soraya Cooper. Soraya Cooper. The small elderly halfling woman says, holding your hand as much to comfort you as to steady herself. As the priest finishes, she steps to the side, collects a basket of roses, and begins to circle as she hands them out to the mourners. The elderly halfling squeezes your hand. It was a nice prayer. That it was. I just wish they didn't have to be here. She casts her eyes to the side, and as you glance over your shoulder, you can see the Asbadean priests standing in the shadow of the temple, watching. One part watching the priestess, as you now know that due to recent proclamations, all religious services have to be attended by a priest of Asmodeus, regardless of faith including those of Shalin, goddess of love and beauty. Ew. Also, they seem to be watching in much the same way of waiting for the Typhlings to go back to where they live. Ew. Yeah. Were it to my choice, I would not have welcomed them here. But here they are, nonetheless. Another Typhling steps up alongside you. Tall, stern feature... She carries herself with the air of someone with experience and, you think, respect. Or at the very least, you view her with respect, and that may color the way that you view her. Stray of a story looks over at the priests. We need to be thankful that at least we are able to hold the funeral here at all. I agree with that statement. However... I do not find myself to be very happy about it. You shouldn't be. But to make sure that that displeasure is put to productive use. <laughs> she squeezes your shoulder. A man makes his way over. You know this to be the brother of Soraya, a tiefling named Walter Cooper, who is also actually a Cooper. Hmm. He makes his way up, speaks to Straya for a moment, thanking her for arranging the funeral. She smiles. You should be thanking Niccolo here. He was the one who made the 
legal arrangements. I wouldn't even know where to begin to navigate the bureaucracy. The man turns and gives Niccolo a long look, his face hard. Something, some exchange happens behind his eyes as he looks Niccolo over before he stiffly extends a hand. Niccolo furtively glances at, at his eyes and uh, shakes Walter's hand as well. I, I just wanted to say I'm a sorry for your loss. His chin firms up. He half glances in the direction of the coffin, still waiting to be lowered into the ground before nodding. Thank you. A few of the other Tiflings nearby watch on curiously, and as the two of you release hands, begin to whisper amongst themselves. As he steps away, the priestess steps forward and extends a rose towards you. Flowers for the dead. I'm sorry for your loss. He takes one. Th thank you. And uh, I did want to also thank you for the ceremony. I didn't know her, but... In all life, there is beauty and love. Mm. And I can see from here, she glances around, that Shilin blessed her with a great deal of love. She was a very amazing woman. Millie releases your hand so that you can still hold an umbrella with one hand and take the rose with the other. Mm. She steps over to Strea, who protects her under her umbrella. You can see that a line, a queue has already formed up of mourners making their way forward to offer their last condolences at the coffin before laying their rose atop it. They begin to form small cliques on the far side of people talking, some quietly, obviously shaken, some more animatedly and obviously angry. Nikola will absolutely get in line, first of all, and secondly, keep in air out toward what people might be talking about. You stand in line. As you approach closer to the coffin, you can hear the new nearby group of young Tiflings talking amongst themselves. Three. It's the third murder in a week. The other one nods. The cards aren't doing anything. They haven't even come down to Devil's Nursery. The third man nods. We need to force the Tatari and the mayor to take this seriously. I hear there's a protest. I'm not going to a protest. Someone has to listen. The men argue with themselves. One of them nods his head, looks back in the direction of the coffin. Once is chance. Twice is coincidence. Three times is a pattern. If no one else is going to stop this, this will happen again. Niccolo, you reach the coffin. I look down at my hand, noticing the wounds that have come from a number of thorns piercing my hand. No, one was a too much. Three. Justice will be done. He then tosses the rose, still covered in a bit of his own blood, down on the coffin. The bloody rose lands on the coffin. You turn back to your friend. There's a peal of thunder, and the sky opens up in sheets as you make your way back. Across the city, back off of the island, back onto the mainland, we find a wide open expanse, exceptionally high walled. And beyond those walls, you find various noble estates, beautiful buildings with their own personal guards. At the furthest south here, is a single large estate. And inside of that estate, we find a dining room hosting the world's most uncomfortable family dinner. <laughs> I know all about those. The table is long and set for at least 15. Although at the moment, there are only great people sitting at the table. Some are children, young. Some are adults. Sitting at the head of the table, is an elderly and stately woman, the Countess. Distantly, the sound of thunder echoes through large bay windows and paints this room otherwise in black and red into long streaks of silver-white light. Towards the head of the table, sitting closest to the Countess, 
is what appears to be a priest of Asmodeus, a half-elven man with fine, sharp features. Next to him is a Hell Knight. The Hell Knight that had been at the Sea Witch Glass earlier that day. Ah, oh, that. As he settles down into a chair. This guy. Jerk. Across from there is a younger woman. Jordan, would you like to describe this younger woman sitting at this yes. uncomfortable dinner table? Yes. Uh, Lucia is uh, about five foot seven um, and 18 years old with straight black hair. She has unusual colored blue eyes that give them this oddly piercing quality no matter where she looks. She holds herself with a distinct noble air of somebody who's grown up in maybe not quite aristocracy, but adjacent to it. So straight backed, head held high. I'm assuming this is a formal dinner, so she's probably not armed at the formal dinner. Um, no, it's family dinner. You yeah. could carry a knife. It is family. I mean, sure. She's, she's <laughs> carrying a knife. Uh, family. <laughs> yeah. She's carrying a knife then for sure. Um, I'm also just yep. imagining she's in a fancy dress she looks very uncomfortable in. Mm. It's red and black like everything else in this house. <laughs> I am going to point out that the uh, background in your own office is black and red. <laughs> okay, now, now you just made it personal. We just transcended. You know, no, it, it's true. My sound paneling is red and black. <laughs> and, Fortunately, and the bloody sacrificial altar is off camera. It's true. Uh, her features are what amounts to distinctly Chalaxian. Um, she has the straight black hair. She has rather pale skin, especially the kind of paleness that, you know, the upper nobility would want to have. So she doesn't exactly look like she's been in the sun all that much. Who needs tanning? I haven't seen the sun in years. <laughs> she hasn't had to work in the yard. If she does choose to work in the yard, she has a servant to carry an umbrella for her while oh, she there does you go. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. She doesn't so much work in the yard as sit in the garden while the servant tends the rose bush. It's true. It's <laughs> so hard watching him work. I mean, um, yeah, I'm that's hard watched. work. I'm going to need a cool lemonade while I watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but despite the the more regal pose, she looks distinctly not quite deflated, but as though she's trying to put on an act of this being normal, even though she looks very uncomfortably over at the Hell Knight and the Asmodean priest. You glance up, look back down. Your plate pretty much untouched through dinner. It's even squid, your favorite. I don't know if that's your favorite, but it is squid. Um, I mean, actually, probably for the area, maybe. <laughs> There's lots of seafood here. Yeah, something something fancy. You know, we eat fancy food here in the fancy lands. Your mother, the Countess Aura, reaches out and literally snaps a finger in front of your face. Mm? Lucia, you weren't paying attention to your cousin's story. You hear the dying laughter at the rest of the table, although some of it's forced, and you think that you miss what was probably a rather inane or possibly morbid joke. My apologies, mother. You were saying? She nods, settles back. Your mother is a powerful woman. She only stands a little bit over five feet tall, and is quite possibly just as wide. Oh, like Queen Victoria. She has a very her. plump, full figure, one denoting not only someone of her station, but also hearkening back to her days as a famed chelish diva whose oh. voice could shatter glass and project across the room. Oh, that's where I get it from. Lucia, by the way, just to specify, definitely not like that. Very much an 18-year-old. I still eat a, a ton of food and I don't put on any weight. <laughs> She's still got that youth uh, metabolism. She got that youth, I know. Man. I miss, we were all there once. I miss <laughs> that yes. metabolism. Now I have to work super hard. Uh, yeah, right? Your cousin gives you a smile. Again, short hewn hair. His helmet literally sits on the table. <laughs> Oh, really? <laughs> this guy. That guy's a... <laughs> His gray eyes oh, yeah. flash in some amusement. Where were you, Lucia? Before you can even answer, your mother simply snorts. Oh, I'm sim sure that she's simply devastating that she cannot perform at the opera now that the Lord Mayor has taken it up as his residence. She was supposed to get top billing until that hag. What was her name? <laughs> Sarina Vincosi. Yes, yes, that Vincosi took top billing from my daughter and regulated her to swords play. What were you, third guard? Hardly a place for someone of your station. Perhaps we should send her a gift. Maybe some chocolates. 
She ponders this for a moment as she looks over <laughs> towards she is, the fire. Saying, those, uh, those chocolates are going to be poisoned. I need to warn her. <laughs> Your cousin simply smiles. I apologize, Lady Lucia. He inclines his head, giving you his warmest smile, what still seems very snake-like. She'll put on the, the four sticks, like the little bit of a smile that like she can manage and kind of nod to him back. I sense an arranged marriage. Here's yeah! your cousin. Don't well, even put hey, that out there in the Back in the, the day, world. that was normal. Yeah. Yeah, I know it's normal, but, but that's, it's not that, cool. It's not cool, man. The way yeah, he it keeps be cool. smiling at her, that's like... He smiled at Atria, too. He just is a creepy smile. He's just smarmy, man. He just got that smarmy smile. Whatever. Just Rome say it wasn't considered weird yeah. back in the day. But Romus sits back up. You know, I am part of the Lord Mayor's protective service I could perhaps put in a good word for you she kind of like tries not to but can't help blanching a little bit I would appreciate that there is a soft laugh from next to your cousin as your uncle Fabrizio simply shakes his head (laughs) the half elf is widely respected in the family for his station even if his elven heritage makes him a little bit of a bastard. (laughs) My dear, let me simply state that you probably wouldn't want to perform in any of the plays being hosted there now. Now Lucio really blanches, like for real color drains out of her face. And she looks terrified. The Countess waves this away. Ramos, will you be staying with us for some time? It is so pleasant to have your company here. The Hell Knight nods. Yes, my order has been brought in to enforce House Thrun's martial law and finally bring Contargo into alignment with the rest of Chiliax. Your uncle, again, I keep stating uncle. He's actually your great uncle. Half elf, he lives for a while. Fair. Smiles. Hmm. I wonder if that means there'll be any more Knights of Ashes. He glances sideways over towards the Hell Knight. You know, having overheard from servants in the garden, that that's the term that everyone seems to be giving to the mysterious fires that broke out immediately before the Lord Mayor showed up and seemed to have burned down the only shrine to Serenre and a number of other houses believed to have contained dissenters before the Lord Mayor even took position. Good grief. The Hell Knight smiles. I have no idea what you mean, Uncle. He literally winks as he turns back to his food. <laughs> oh, come oh on. Oh, they're so evil. <laughs> they're just mustache twirling. <laughs> However, I can say with some certainty that there are at least a few less vermin in the city now that some of these less pleasant establishments have burned down. Ew. A laughter goes up through the family. Again, in some cases, it's the polite laughter. In some cases, it's they seem to find that legitimately funny. Yeah. Your uncle turns back. And will you be present tomorrow at the protest? Ramos shakes his head. No, there's no need. There are no wolves left in Cantargo. Only dogs. We've seen to that. Obviously, he has never seen a chihuahua. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna say. Small but mighty. Small but mighty. Those are the ones you really gotta worry about. <laughs> Ankle biters. Oh, man. A laugh Goodness. goes up through the room once again at this. As Lucia, you think back to what that could mean. Lucia will turn to her mother. May I be excused? Feeling off tonight? A little bit, yes. Hmm. She reaches out with one pudgy hand and gently pats your hand. Of course, dear. Don't worry. Mother will make sure that when the opera opens again, you'll have top billing where you belong. I'll smile at her, because even though she's evil as all get out, that would please Lucia. (laughs) (laughs) Even though it means that that they're probably going to kill the competition. But Well, you know, I obviously don't want her to die, because I'm sure I've worked (laughs) in other shows with that girl. But like, you know, I wouldn't mind being the lead. There's a number of just mysterious disappearances the night before. (laughs) (laughs) But Lucia, you stand up, you make your way down. 
before you can even exit the end of the dining room, which, by the way, is like the dining room from the uh, the Batman movie where they're sitting on like the it's far like, sides like and have a ridiculously huge dining room. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, you miss whatever the joke is, but you can again hear that forced laughter that goes through everyone. It's somewhat notable and you probably hate it a bit about yourself, but everyone in your family seems to have the same laugh, which is slightly piercing. Yeah, it's a little shrill. Little. You can, yeah, it's like you can tell yeah. it's the Sereni family laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the yeah, Joker. it's a little Joker. <laughs> oh, gracious, God. gracious! Like a whole room full of them. Lucia will uh, exit the room with like as much grace as she can manage before like closing the door and then running back to her room. <laughs> you rush back down the hallways. The wood here is dark and lacquered, so that at night it's almost black. Candles are lit, but they seem to provide scant illumination, and suits of armor stand between the various doorways here. The carpet is so obnoxiously thick that you cannot even hear the sound of your footsteps as you run down the rug. That's crazy. You, however, do manage to make your way up to the second floor, reach your bedroom, open the door, step through. I imagine shut the door behind you. Yes. And Lucia will immediately start trying to take off this awful dress. Very well. You tear the dress off, throw it on the bed. Giant four-posted bed with curtains hanging around the outside edge. It has a small stepladder for you to climb up into the bed as it sits four feet high with its two mattresses. Jazz, that's just obnoxiously (laughs) too much. All right. Um, Lucia will get the dress off. She goes out onto the balcony, even though it's pouring rain, and looks under one of the potted plants... And there's nothing underneath it. And she just kind of... (sighs) Looking out from here, you almost imagine that you could see the burned out ruins in the town from the Night of Ashes. Leaning out from here, you can certainly see the burned out ruins of the Viticora estate, the noble house that burned on the Night of Ashes as well. Oh, because they didn't support Thrun? Hmm. Yikes. Lucia let out another sigh and uh, reach underneath her uh, her bed where she's got a small uh, chest that she pulls out, opening it up, finds a bag, pulls that bag open, grabs some clothing and puts on like, you know, just normal people boots with some <laughs> leather pants and a white embroidered shirt and a cloak like just normal oh, people clothes. You're out you know. to, get, uh, to get God, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, she uh, just like she. Sorry, I forgot like, to mention embroidery is outlawed by one of the proclamations mm-hmm. as well. Unless you yes, paid it is. the fancy Unless you thing paid. or whatever. Unless you paid. Um, so she puts this. She puts all of this on, like breathing a sigh of just like, oh, finally. Pulls her rapier out, puts the rapier on. You know, slips on some studded leather armor over her uh, embroidered shirt, and then slings on the cloak, and just kind of sits there for a second, just looking at herself in the mirror. <laughs> It's like, God, I look so cool. No, not like yeah. that. More, <laughs> she looks, despite the fact that she's more comfortable, more kind of just dejected mm. by it all. She pulls out a flyer that's been folded up 20 times so that it's really small and kind of stares at it again. <sighs> Maybe there's something else out there. She kind of looks back at the door with this, like, just kind of disgusted look on her face. Maybe it's time. Distantly, you yeah. hear a high peal of laughter. Yeah. Uh, she put, she slings the pack over her, uh, over her shoulder, kind of looks over the room one last time and just says, well, guess it's time to say goodbye, House Serini. And then she like grabs all the blankets off of it, ties them up into a, uh, a rope so she can like slide down, like rappel down to the first floor and then disappear into the rain with only the clothes on her back and whatever she got in the backpack. You disappear. As you begin to exit, the sky opens up in a torrential storm. Lightning forks across the sky, thunder peals. Back on the island, for our fifth and final introduction here, a woman stands on a quiet street in the rain, under an umbrella, standing before the burnt out ruins that were once Judging by the sign out front, the Silver Star Music Store. 
the building so badly burned that it has collapsed in on itself, almost forming a sinkhole here at the edge of the city, with the water pouring down and into it. Distantly, there are the sounds of people in the surrounding buildings, talking, song. A small tavern that caters to dock workers down the street from here. Every time its door opens, music spilling from inside before it closes again. Rachel, would you like to describe this character? Yes. Vittoria stands tall looking at the ruined building. She has a slender frame. She also stands at about 5'8", five, 5'9", five, depending on whether or not she's wearing her boots. She definitely takes after her mother's elfin heritage, uh, inheriting the high cheekbones and dark eyes, but she has lighter hair. Her ears don't have quite the same length as a full-blooded elf, but she does have the distinct point. Right now, she's wearing kind of a more masculine tunic, favoring pants most days because she spends a lot of time out and about. She is impeccably dressed, however. Everything about her tunic, her belts, her boots, her jacket, everything is in order and in place as it should be. Perception is everything. I can be one of those people, I see. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. So I believe she's standing there balancing the umbrella with the crook of her elbow so she can hold a book with one hand, writing in it with her quill with the other. Yes. Vittoria, you look down at your notes. You look back towards the building. You jot down on the opposite page a number of questions. Usually just one word. Vitakora Serenre? Silver Star? Shinsen? As you continue to jot down your notes, you hear the soft sound of approaching feet. And looking over your shoulder, you see two Datari making their rounds, looking miserably soaked in the rain. You can hear the clink, 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 clink sound of the raindrops bouncing off their metal helmets as they make their way about. One guard looks over, sees you, holds up a hand in acknowledgement as he makes his way forward, a guard that you know, Morgar Manthai. He smiles. Vittoria Scordato. On the case? More or less. I'm doing a bit of a private investigation. Oh. Huh. The other guard, which you don't know, steps forward, looks you once over, looks over the ruin. Mm. Shame what happened at the music shop. I hear the owner was a Serenite. He says, glancing over, mentioning the goddess of sun and healing and, generally speaking, most things good and righteous in the world. <laughs> Maybe her, uh, her shop burned down because she was worshipping the flame too much. <laughs> he, uh, yes. He laughs. Morgar just nods a little bit in that, yeah, sure, <laughs> sort of way. <laughs> yep, you made it funny. Good job. The man's face becomes a little bit more serious. Were you friends with them? Friends? No. I am just saw the state of it and was curious. Well, maybe if she followed a proper religion and was a more loyal citizen, then these accidents could have been avoided. Accidents seem to be a plenty nowadays. Mm. A lot of people are not being careful enough. Mm. The guard turns to continue his patrol. Morgar watches him for a moment, lagging behind. Turn so his right shoulder is facing your right as you're almost at cross directions. Be careful of the new guards. He nods towards his partner. They've been more aggressive, and those who are more supportive of the citizenry have been relegated to desk jobs. Mm. Unfortunate. You should stay out of the new Lord Mayor's business. Victoria just gives him a, a smile of, yes, of course. And stay away from the park tomorrow. The guards are going to be out in force. Sometimes it's best not to look too deep. Well, we both know I'm not very good at that. He shakes his head, taps the edge of his helmet in salute. Good evening, Lady Scordato. I am no lady, and that you know well. You're certainly higher crust than I am. You're a crusty he loaf. 
<laughs> Not upper what a crust, strange thing crust. to say. <laughs> Sorry, too much Great British Bake Off. <laughs> well, she's not upper crust, but no soggy bottoms. No soggy bottoms. <laughs> but you look back towards the burned-out ruins. In the distance, off towards your right, you can see the dome of the Opera Theater, where you know that the new Lord Brazili Throne is now staying. Maybe it's the Lord Mayor who should have stayed out of our business. Ooh, feisty Rachy. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have Feisty Rachy, Feisty uh, Heather. Lots of feistiness. There's a pill of thunder. And all of you rest up for the evening. If this were a movie or a show or whatever, this would be where they open in credits to see the whole <laughs> thing. <and start> <laughs> <laughs> nice. Hell Hell's Rebels. Rebels. <laughs> Do we all get matching leather jackets? Please tell me we all get matching leather jackets. Everyone gets matching leather jackets. There's a little like montage thing where it just shows everyone like at mm -hmm. least running away dramatically from one explosion. <laughs> Raven also has a tiny leather jacket that she wears. Yeah. You know? Raven's yeah. wearing a tiny leather jacket, somehow diffusing a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> She's using her little claw. Using her little wire. claw to yeah. cut the red wire. Yeah. Yes, that's a whole thing. Uh, no. <laughs> So I suppose then, all of you sleep through the night. Did uh, did Lucia find a nice uh, bridge to sleep under? Definitely. There is a bridge. There's only one, so, you know. How much money do you start with, Jordan? Uh, let's see. According to my character, I still have... I still have two gold, five silver, and eight copper. You have plenty of money. Yeah, you have plenty okay. of money for an yeah, end. I am totally fine. Mm -hmm. I got money. You spent the other ten gold pieces that you took for your end room because you have no concept of... Uh, conserving money or anything like that so <laughs> you right. broke out of that there and went oh i'm soaking right. wet and bought the best in-room you could find and had a nice warm bath yeah. and woke up got your feet pedicured hey just because i'm roughing it doesn't mean i need to be roughing it <laughs> <laughs> there's roughing it and then there's you know so hard. roughing it and then i suppose all of you get up the next day in the pre-dawn light it's the protest in the morning yeah, it's in the morning. Mm -hmm. It's dawn. Adrian yeah. makes sure she has her mom bag with like snacks and a first aid kit and like extra <laughs> water bottles and like, oh, you know, band-aids. Oh, yeah. I guess he tacks a uh, classes are canceled today notice before he heads out because it's Oath Day, which is Thursday. That's classes. Yeah, that's class day. It's the middle of the week. Yep. <laughs> Lucia wakes up in her redonkulously expensive hotel room and packs up her stuff and then goes, oh, wait, I don't have enough money for another night of this. <laughs> yeah, and exactly you, right. <laughs> you open up your bag and you shove all like the complimentary food stuff that's served at the uh, the open breakfast downstairs into the bag. Bottled and water. I'm out. definitely going to need this later. <laughs> Do they have waffles in the shape of Kentargo? Yes. yes. Oh, my God. The shape of yes. <laughs> They do now. On the other side of the city, I guess technically actually on the same side of the city as uh, the professor is leaving his, because uh, I believe you stay. I have a room at the academy. Yeah, you have a room at the academy and you're leaving, not noticing the uh, young woman walking by in her, uh, I guess, investigator's best. I blend in, thank you. <laughs> as she leaves the uh, the coffee shop across the street from the academy. <laughs> I'm probably holding a cup of coffee because I work there. That's fair. <laughs> oh, you work? Okay, wait a minute. I thought you were like an investigator, like private eye. I am, but I got it on the pay side. The bills. <laughs> She's a barista oh. slash investigator. Yeah. Oh. See, I, I work at the coffee shop. I don't know. I've, for some reason, I pictured you with that big, wide brimmed hat that has like a press badge stuck into the brim of it. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Haha. you say that, and all I can think is Carmen San Diego. Yeah, yeah. yeah a little bit. <laughs> and then, of course. uh, Nicolo wakes up from his, uh... I have a studio apartment. <laughs> oh, okay. You wake up from your studio apartment, roll out of bed, cook in your, uh, your kitchen, which is also your bedroom, yes. which is also your shower. Yes. Then make your way down the, uh, the rickety steps outside, being certain to skip over the fourth step from the bottom, as it will not support your weight. Yes. Oh. But there's also no, you know, management or anything to complain about it, so. And the nails are almost as bad as D4s. Yes. <laughs> ah. oh. <laughs> almost. Yeah. You make your way, and then by the time that sunrise comes, you arrive at Aria Park. The park is large. Usually it's popular amongst street performers and musicians. If there are street, street performers or musicians here, it's difficult to tell due to the sheer number of other people present. Mm. 
You weren't exactly certain what kind of turnout the city could expect, but there must be at least two, three hundred people here. <laughs> Even with the cobblestones of Argent Avenue and the foliage of Aria Park still wet from the morning's rain, dozens of Kentargans have gathered along the front face of the Opera House to protest the city's new Lord Mayor, Paracount, and High Inquisitor, Brazil I Thrun. The city's new leader was appointed by her infernal magistrix, Queen Abergel II, in the wake of the previous Lord Mayor's sudden flight from the city, an event that still has local rumor mongers whispering furiously. In a scant seven days, Paracount Thrun has instituted martial law, a curfew, seven outlandish polarizing proclamations, amongst other changes. These actions and more have called many of Cantargo's disenfranchised citizens here on this overcast morning. There's been no sign yet of Brazil I Thrun himself, and the Opera House doors remain tightly closed, as they have since the man chose that landmark as his new home. Hmm. But judging by the growing sound of the protesters, surely he can't ignore the scene on the streets for much longer. What kind of a guy comes into town and says, you know where I want to live? I want to live in a theater. There's a castle I mean, he could live in. Maybe he's like guard and stuff and he just feels like that's where he belongs could be <laughs> he's the phantom of the opera that would be funny he's actually dead yeah, the opera's not dead oh no, but this like, is galarian he, yeah so. it's galarian he could be a phantom you know as you arrive you can hear the banging drums chants and marching in front of the opera house people holding up a variety of signs calling for the return of the Lord Mayor, thrown to get lost, etc., etc. And I suppose we'll go ahead and just start with, uh, yeah, we'll start with Jessica. Okay. Arriving at the protest, you can see that there are scores of people here yelling as they make their way back and forth. There are a few vendors who've actually shown up to also cater to the event. Those people You're are gonna smart. You're going to guess the more, oppor yeah, the more opportunistic amongst the, uh, the citizenry. <laughs> citizenry. Nice. Got some food trucks, you know. Some food trucks, yeah, exactly. all the rest of that. Well, there's a band, apparently. <laughs> you know? Yeah, apparently. It's mostly just a whole bunch of people banging drums, but <laughs> whatever, whatever's the loudest thing you can find. I mean, Adria's looking for like a first aid station or like, you know, because she brought her mom bag of stuff. She's ready to like help patch people up if things turn sideways or go sideways. So she's looking for like a place to kind of set up so that like people can know like if you're hurt, you come here. Okay. Uh, so, game mechanically speaking, real quick, there are a number of actions that you can take here. Cool. Uh, as the day's protests go on, you can select from the following. You can listen for rumors, if you're interested in hearing a little bit about what's going on in the town, maybe. You can pilfer, if you want to try to <laughs> line your pockets by pickpocketing wow. people or really? whatever you want to do here. I mean, yeah. You can uh, rabble rouse, if you want to uh, better <laughs> organize the protest by attempting diplomacy checks or perform checks. Oh, sweet. You can silence undesirable elements as there are other factions here counter-protesting right now, and some people here showing up and using the protest as a cover for doing things like the pilfer action that we were just talking about and, a second ago. And trying to create anarchy, yeah. Yes. Uh, you can also choose to watch the crowd, and by doing this, you can kind of watch over the crowd looking for anything unusual. Okay, well, I'm going to watch the crowd. Okay. You can see that more and more citizens are steadily pressing into the area. By the time that Lucia arrives, the crowds are starting to get fairly thick. You've gotten the impression from your family that Brazilia hasn't taken any of these protests very seriously. That notwithstanding, there are still a dozen Datari guards, the local city guard, stationed around the outside of the building. Interesting they're local guards and not Hell Knights. Uh, as well as what appears to be one woman that seems to wander amongst the guards speaking to them, a scowling dark-haired woman who eyes the crowds but continues to make her way about. She mostly stands in the vicinity of the locked front door to the structure. Hmm. I am going to rabble rouse. <laughs> All right. Start getting people get riled up for fighting. I do want to say right. I am not wearing my armor because I am playing. I would not have taken my armor and brought it out here because I don't wear that in my normal life. Okay. It's the difference of like one AC. So Lucia, you take this in. You kind of start, uh, you know, yay, let's protest. Yay, everyone's you're that you're that person that's trying to start like a chant. Yeah, you got the chance. 
you know, science, not silence. And you're just like marching back and for- forth in front of the place. This is what Kentargo looks I like. I want to wear embroidery. One, two, three, four. Send the mayor outside that door. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, actually. Yep. Slogans. Yeah. We have them. Mm-hmm. It's about this point that Cesare, you arrive, your cat clinging tightly onto your shoulder. Uh, this is a lot of people. That, what did you expect, honestly? I mean, I thought it was going to be kind of a sit down. <laughs> you <laughs> thought that we were going to sit down with the thrones? No, more sit down around in protests. I mean, that's what I would do. <laughs> but how old is this cat and doesn't realize that's not how protests work? That's how a cat protest works. <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it's true. True. I thought we were going to sit on their counters and knock things off one by one. Mm-hmm. Has anyone yeah. tried just laying in front of the doorway? <laughs> <laughs> just maybe scratching occasionally, meowing to be let in. Cesare just pat reaches up and pats her on the head. Just uh, stay on my shoulder and you should be okay. Her claws pierce into your shoulder and she nods. Ow. As you make your way here, you can see, again, as previously described, you can tell that as the day's starting to wear on, you're a little bit coming in a little bit later. The guards here appear to be nervous and a little edgy. You get the impression that they were not expecting a crowd this large. Mm. However, things seem to be peaceful so far. And most of the people are maintaining a perimeter. Most of the people are staying to the park, which is across the street. And as long as they seem to be maintaining that distance, which is at least some uh, 30 feet, then they seem to be okay with it. Mm. What would you like to do? I guess I'll use my uh, diplomacy to try to figure out some rumors. See if I can find anything good. It's a secret role, right? Yes. Gathering information is secret. Secrets. So shortly after that, Vittoria arrives. There are a number of protesters here calling for the new Lord Mayor to lift his unreasonable restrictions, while others are calling for an end to foreign rule and demand a proper election to uh, determine Lord Mayor Benilu's successor, being the previous Lord Mayor before Brazilla Thrun took over. Many others seem to be content to merely yell and agitate. Uh, However, there are a growing minority that show their unabashed support of Brazili throne, arguing back against the protesters. I suppose she'll probably kind of meander and gather information as well, because that's what she does. Okay. So you're going to meander through the crowd, gather some information? Yes. Very well. Nicolo, you're the last to arrive having to walk uphill pretty much the entire way from the devil's nursery because it's at the bottom of the hill. Yep. As far away from polite society as possible. Yep. You arrive seeing that there's a large crowd here consisting of Kentargan partisans who seem to despise Chiliax's tightening grip on their city and demanding local rule. There are some economic conservatives here who seem to feel that the, feel the squeeze as through and annex new taxes and mm. business policies there are various advocates of democracy hmm. whose bitterest complaint is Thrun's appointment instead of actual uh, legal election and seem to be calling for actual legal vote to see whether or not the city wants him. Is there normally uh, elections for Lord Mayor? Is that like a thing they've done previously or is that just like a, a new Andorin concept? The Lord Mayor is usually appointed by council. Ah, okay. But there are some people that are actually calling for a popular vote instead of just a council appointment. Hmm. In large okay. part because the council doesn't seem to be doing anything about this guy just showing up and saying, I'm mayor now and putting a hat on and just going about his business. I mean, to be fair, they were probably told if they said anything, they were going to be disappeared next. So uh, there are also some anarchists. Hmm. These mostly seem to be thugs that you think are just waiting for an actual fight to break out and are every once in a while just pushing people on purpose or seeming to argue both sides just mm-hmm. in an attempt to actually aggravate people. Oh, these guys. Uh, and on top of all of that, there are also chillish loyalists. Who are here supporting Thrun's actions to curb the city's dissent- dissentious streak. We don't need their kind around here, I think. Are you going to try to silence them? Yeah, time to be scary, oh, man. Oh, bring that intimidation. <laughs> you do get a bonus. They're going to regret the day that they decided to commandeer the protest. All right. So I'm going to need an intimidation check from Ross because he's the only one that's not doing a secret role. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah, apparently coercing people is not secretive. Interesting. <laughs> Who, Who knew? thought? I mean, I, that's yeah. <laughs> you can see if it works, I guess. Yeah. You know whether people are intimidated by you or not. And you're attempting to quiet down the uh, chillish loyalists, correct? Uh-huh. 
I'm scared about this. So I rolled a natural one. Oh, <laughs> here what a point. start. Exactly. For this, I mean, it's really early on, but it's a natural one. <laughs> so Welcome to second yeah, edition, let's everyone. Do something about that. We can help fix our natural ones. I literally can't do worse. So let's try this That's again, true. shall we? Yep, you do have a hero point. Mm-hmm. Did you roll another one? Y'all. <laughs> Y'all. No! No! Seriously? No! Y'all. <laughs> Seriously? That'll be one of those games, huh? Yep, rolled oh. another natural one. There we go. Oh, God. Jeez. I'm out of hero points, so that's all I got. Oh. All right. Yikes. The worst part is I have a plus six. <laughs> all right, so who all is watching the crowd? Me, Adria. There's a general mood of agitation and discontentment, although nothing violent. Hmm. You think a vast majority of the people here are, to, are here to peacefully express their displeasure with the government and push for change, but not, you don't anticipate anyone throwing a brick through a window or anything like that. Okay. <laughs> you, however, yet you don't actually see it happen, but you do see a couple of people complaining about someone stealing from them. Hmm. Uh oh. On your next action, you can try to maybe find the thief if you're interested. Okay. In the meantime, you just know that there's someone picking pockets here. Mm. Lucia, you are rabble rousing, correct? Rabble rousing. You managed to come up with a couple good slogans to start chanting with the crowd here and Hi, uh, and start to kind of get them a little bit further on your side as you start uh, diplomatizing them. Mechanically, what this means is you will get a plus one bonus on an upcoming charisma based skill check of your choice during the protest or after. Ooh, uh, as that's long as cool. it's with protesters. That's cool. So you're just kind of building up a rapport. You're getting them to march around. You're improving their current slogan of Brazil I sucks. To something a little bit more <laughs> catchy. I mean, it's not false, though. <laughs> <laughs> From there, Cesare, you are... Using diplomacy check to get some rumors or info. Checking or looking around, trying to find any useful rumors. No, most people here are basically just talking about how much they hate Throne. Yeah. And All so right. there's not really... It's, it's like, hey, what do you think about this new restaurant that opened up or anything like that? There's nothing else as far as useful gossip that you managed to pick up. Boo. At least you didn't critically fail. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Brazil has a dragon in disguise. What? I always suspected. I it. What? But... <laughs> yeah. Victoria, I believe you are perceptioning for rumors. Yes. Uh, you do manage to pick up on a single rumor as you're listening. You hear two people chatting off towards the side, uh, one of them pushing for the return of the previous Lord Mayor, which they're certain that they have locked away in a dungeon somewhere. The other one simply shakes his head. I heard that Lord Mayor Banlis didn't flee to Arcadia like so many people are saying. No, I heard she broke her neck falling down a flight of stairs, praying a bit hard to Kayleen, if you understand what I mean. Yikes. Oh, God. The other man just stares blankly, hit, hit in the bottle. Anyway, I hear she's dead. <laughs> the other guy just snorts before saying that she's probably starting up a new colony off in Arcadia now. And then we have yeah. uh, Ross, who's silencing dissenters, which I already got the role for. Not so. very well, apparently. <laughs> Not very well. They're mostly just shouting, you know, you suck, as they make their way off. So do you. Hmm. I was kind of... And being that you're also trying to deal with the chelish sympathizers and everything, I'm sure there's probably some stabs at the fact that you're a tiefling. Yeah, well... Because they also tend to be racist. They can yep, stuff it. All right. But you move on after about an hour or so of this. Cesare, as you're beginning to make your way back through the crowds, not managing to find anyone here interested in listening to you, uh, in large part, you think it's because so many of them are avoiding you because they're your students. <laughs> <laughs> and they want to have to talk to their professor after class. <laughs> oh, God, it's Professor Nightbloom. Quick, duck away before he starts talking about Tangle Briar and the elves return back to the elf gates again. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> be honest it's usually the other way around you see a student and you're like oh god yeah. <laughs> so we're dodging for each other for just a moment <laughs> for just a moment Cesare through the window through the curtains on the second floor of the opera house the large windows that can open but they're currently closed you see the curtains are parted ever so slightly for a moment by hand and a face glances down a high angular face noble looks down onto the street you can see a flash of red and black of maybe some sort of Asmodean robes. Someone's watching from inside. Mm. 
So circling back around, Jess, are you still watching the crowd? Yes. Very well. You continue to watch the crowds. You don't see this pickpocket. However, it's strange, but you almost get the impression watching the people here that there's some sort of unusual subcurrent in the crowd's movement, as if there were an organizing force amongst the people. Someone seems to be directing some of these people. And then every once in a while, you see people stationed almost, keeping an eye on the surrounding people or the surrounding protesters. Okay, so like plants. Maybe. I'm going to clue in on these guys for a while. Very well. Make a note that you will get a bonus for this later. You will get a plus two bonus on whatever you choose to roll for your initiative if trouble should break out. Okay. You say should like it's not going to happen. Yeah, we never know. That brings us over to Lucia. All right. Lucia has no reason not to continue to rabble rouse. So you continue to do your rabble rousing? Ooh. So I just could feel that, didn't I? You thought you had a winner. Uh-oh. But it turns out that people aren't exactly interested in using the term, you know, kick his hiney, as opposed to something <laughs> a little bit harsher. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, you're no longer in the in crowd and you've lost your bonus as they no, no. longer trust you. Oh. <laughs> like, we even, thought you even, were cool. <laughs> even in second edition, I can't roll. <laughs> even my not rolling. does the rolling <laughs> too. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm using his luck, not mine. What about Cesare? Still rumor mongering? Can I use my diplomacy to get the any of the ra- any of the people from the other side to go away, or is that just intimidate? It's only intimidate. Rude. Unfortunately, it turns out they won't listen to reasoned arguments. I wonder why. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll just continue gathering information. All right. You begin to circle around, start to talk to a couple of people. You happen to mention in passing something about the, the Night of Ashes and everything that's been going on. A man who's obviously been out here since early this morning, judging by the bags under his eyes, nods. Mm, Yeah, the thrashing badger burned down a few nights ago. They're saying it was uh, another bar fight gone too far, but they're just a bunch of drunk old professors and barristers. Seems like a lot of places that burned down between that, the Silver Star, the Victoria Estate. I'm starting to believe people when they say that it was more planned and not an accident. What about this uh, bar makes you think that that was planned? Well, I mean, it burned down on the same night as a bunch of the others, and uh, again, the Thrashing Badger, they they served alcohol and tea, but uh, from what I understand, most people went there for backroom political discussions, and he looks around nervously for a moment before leaning in. I heard they have non-revised history books. Ooh, Ooh, that's the good stuff. That's the good stuff. <laughs> well, not anymore. It burned to the ground. I yeah. guess that's true, yeah. It was the good stuff. For those who don't know, Kentargo burns their history books every single year and revises them. That's Chiliax. Them. That's all Chiliax. All of Chiliax, yeah. That's all. Okay, good point. All of Chiliax does that. Interesting side note. You know who's in charge of that? The Order of the Rack. The Order of the Rack Hell Knights. Oh, of yeah. Of course well, they are. Of course stuff. they are. <laughs> yep. Turns out they're into book burnings, too. Who knew? Hmm. Fascist regimes. Yeah. So in the meantime, Victoria, you gathering information still? I'm going to continue my information gathering. All right. You hear an argument coming from a small group off towards the side, and you're surprised to see a trio of tiflings arguing with a halfling. The man seems to be waving away whatever their concerns are before one of them shakes his head. Look, someone's killing tiflings down in Devil's Nursery. I've heard that whoever's doing it is literally taking trophies, but I don't know what kind. It's as bad as it's ever been down there. This isn't street fights or muggings or gangs. The halfling nods. Oh, great. Sounds like the slasher is back, and that's the last thing we need. Uh, Hold on. Let me roll for Victoria here. This also. All I'll say for Victoria is you are aware that the slasher was a famed serial killer from a while back. You've studied a little bit into it. From what you understand, he also was a serial killer that took trophies. Hmm. Sounds like somebody is using it as a front. Although from what you understand, the slasher, he did not limit himself to tiflings. Ah. Copycat, maybe. And then, uh, Niccolo. 
Still trying to silence people? <laughs> yeah, I guess I'll try to find people that are causing problems. Yeah, maybe not necessarily. Well, are they different groups or am I just doing it in general? Uh, you have to choose a group. Okay. So they're like the anarchists, the chelish loyalists, mm -hmm. the economic conservatives. Maybe they won't push back so much. If I try again on the um, on the loyalists, is there a problem with that? Or like, would I take a penalty? No, you can keep shouting at them if you want. I'll try. All right, let's try it. You. Hey, that's much better. Okay. Yay. This time I rolled a 15 for a 21 total. There nice. we go. Mm -hmm. Not critically nice, but nice. Mm -hmm. There are a couple other people over here trying reasoned arguments, and eventually you just step up and go, look, if you're here to start trouble, get the F out. Mm. <laughs> I'll show you trouble. Or they kind of like step up towards you and like stand on their toes to like look directly in your face and like the chest to chest kind of thing. And then when you just narrow your eyes and stare down with like the scar going down the side of your face and your, your eyes maybe flash uncomfortably at just the proper moment, mm -hmm. he kind of backs away. Uh, what's lame here anyway? And grabs his buddy and walks off. I whip my tail in a so there gesture and then turn around. <laughs> <laughs> that brings us around to uh, to hour three. What is Adria doing? Can I walk up to one of those people that seems like they're a plant? Uh, yeah, if you want. Uh, I'm just going to like offer them some water and be like, hey, you might be dehydrated. You got to stay hydrated at things like this. The person takes it, smiles. Let me make a secret roll here real quick. Yeah, like I kind of want to get a read on them. <laughs> Diplomatizing the plants. But the man smiles, takes it. Thank you. He then yanks it back for the briefest moment as he brings his arm up and takes a drink. His cloak shifts and you see the edge of a red armband wrapped around his arm. Oh, oh no. He smiles and nods, handing the, uh, the empty water skin back to you. She puts it in her bag and she kind of leans forward and says, uh, hey, uh, if you're here undercover, you may want to make sure your armband ain't showing. He glances down, seeing that you're doing it on the sly, smiles. Thank you, citizen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> helping. That's the plan. You got to make people think that you're helping them. Before you stab them in the back. Well, now I know like that guy for sure is bad. So that means all these other plans are probably also bad. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know any of you guys. So it's not like I can share that information. It's true. No. Yeah. yeah, true. We're still independent. Lucia. All right, I have to redeem myself and rabble rouse some more with feeling. No more uh, now. Right. Once more with feeling. Yes, exactly. Nope, they're not digging it. <laughs> well, they're, they're looking for stuff that is a little bit more creative and curse wordy, and you're coming up with things that are a little bit more highbrow and intelligent. <laughs> uh, okay. You're like explaining through the whole thing. There's one person that's just like, if you have to explain the chant, it's not funny. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, you don't understand me. <laughs> but she like storms off like fine. <laughs> oh. Chisra? I think I'm just gonna find like a tree to lean against and watch the crowd for a little while. Okay. Maybe dislodge Raven from my shoulder. Okay. I'm gonna so you I'm gonna hold up her, against a tree. But I'm not gonna like I need claws out of my shoulder for an hour. <laughs> so you prop yourself up against a tree. You do see a single suspicious individual making her way around and giving water to people. <laughs> <laughs> you kind of watch her out of the side of your eye. Water? <laughs> she even offers water to you. <laughs> How suspicious is that? She's an alchemist. They're all just uh, I don't have any giving you bull strength. Things. Oh, God. Actually, that would be pretty awesome. It's like, oh, yeah, here's some bull strength for you. And I mean, it doesn't, potions don't actually work that way anymore. Just calm emotions. No. It's just all yeah. calm emotions. It's just calm emotions. Um, <laughs> Victoria. Victoria wants to pay more attention to like individual people now rather than just listening to rumors like how people are acting. Okay, so you want to watch the crowd? Yeah. Okay. You get the feeling that people are becoming steadily more and more aggravated. You do notice that there is a single figure making his way through the crowd, going along, chatting to people, but he seems almost more watching, pointedly keeping his hood pulled low to the point that like, if the wind shift, shifts, his hand darts up, immediately grabs his hood and keeps it down over his face. And a 
so blatantly suspicious that you think it's almost suspicious that it's so suspicious. <laughs> <laughs> Weird. You keep an eye on this figure, and you have a lore Cantargo, don't you? I do indeed. I have a really good lore Cantargo. This is the slasher. <laughs> You found him. He's got a knife. Oh, God. Oh, gosh. He's slashing. Oh, no. Oh, okay. Uh, now Rachel's got it. Secret messages from there we go to Niccolo. All right. Let's try to maybe get rid of some of these anarchists. I have a bad feeling about that. Hmm. I mean, I don't know if this actually helps or not, but I'm driving people away. Hmm? Yeah, I mean, if you're not going to help, get out of here. Yeah. Go ahead and make your intimidation, and let's see. All right. Uh, this one was just, nah. Uh, Roll to six, plus six is 12, so, eh. Again, you're, you're just like, I did pretty good back there and all the rest of that, but then you, know, you kind of turn around, and someone falls over or whatever, and you, like, help them up to, the, up to their feet, and then the anarchist is like, he's not hardcore. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, they're no longer paying attention to you. Sad. Fine. Following this... A number of people get up to make impassioned speeches as the day wears on. Most of them standing on the edge of the fountain across the street from the opera and shouting out to the crowds. As you watch, one man jumps up onto the edge, turns back towards the crowds as a couple of people cheer him. He's facing the crowds and not towards the opera house as most people have jumped up onto the edge and shouted towards the opera house or yelled their profanities at throne. This man turns back for Vittoria's edification. The man that you saw trying to hide his face as he was navigating the crowd. Uh Uh-oh. He holds up his hands. Fellow citizens, please listen. We can take back our city if we work together. We cannot let Thrun separate us. People... People I know have died fighting for our city's freedom. We need to unite to do more and better. There were those who stood for what was right and just before, before this time. Years ago, before Thrun ruled, there were those who defended our city. The Silver Ravens are not forgotten. There's a murmur that goes through the crowd, Hmm. especially as he's talking about something redacted. Mm. That's not in the history books. The crowds grow quiet before there's a cheer that erupts through them and clapping echoes through the city streets. Distantly, you hear the bells the devil's bells, as all of you know, that ring seemingly at with no reason or pattern. Do I know why they would ring the bells with my lore, Asmodean? Let me roll your lore, Asmodean, real quick. Let me also roll Vittorius. For my Kentargo lore? Your Kentargo lore, because it would also fall into this category. And Vittoria, you are aware that there is no rhyme or reason to why the devil's bells ring. Chesre, you are aware that there is no rhyme or reason to why the devil's bells ring because the Asmodeans don't ring them. They are the bells that have been left Ooh. over in the temple since it was the temple of Aridin, but no one knows why the devil's bells ring. Hmm. They do chime out three sharp notes. The crowd falls silent, except for there is a clapping that continues. A slow... The crowd, almost in unison, turns back towards the face of the opera house, looks up to its second floor windows, which now stand wide open. A man stands here now, the Lord Mayor Barzillai Throne. The man is middle-aged with short, dark hair, imposing, dressed in red and orange and black clothing with an ornate breastplate all embroidered with the pentagram of Asmodeus and the cross of Chiliax. He steps in front of the almost floor-to-ceiling window. The curtains blow gently past him, and he holds in one hand a flute of wine. (laughs) He stops his slow clap, 
looks down at the crowd Wait, with a how smile. Can he, how can he clap if he's holding a wine? Yeah, he's doing like the... I was mm-hmm. just making it clap oh, for oh, dramatic okay. purpose. Oh, okay. Like the opera clap? The opera ah, clap. Ah, okay. The gathering swiftly grows quiet. Uh, my adoring public, I'm sorry to say that I have not yet adapted to your quaint country ways, being accustomed as I am to the sophistication and learning of Agorian. Nonetheless, know, my people, that I have heard your concerns and that I appreciate your valued feedback. And know that we shall eventually find the mutual understanding in the fullness of time. He begins to pace in front of the window. I take pride in updating Kentargo's quaint, outdated laws to the modern standards the city deserves, and strengthening its ties with the Empire during these cruel times. But, obviously, I have approached my duties too aggressively. You say you chafe at the presence of non-natives in positions of power. That authorities, not of this city, have come in and have no place as its leaders. That you will not be yoked by intruders. Your Lord Mayor hears you. But so it is with a heavy heart that I issue this proclamation Up, here we in go. response to your demands. All ship's captains are hereafter barred from leaving their vessels and setting foot on Cantargo docks or streets under pain of, let's say, squassation. What the what heck does, does squassation even mean? I think he means they're going to be squashed. The crowd erupts in yells of protest. Wait, wait, wait. So he... Say it again. What exactly is so he So no doing? ship captains can leave their ships. Or else he's going to basically that, crush them to death. That is bullcrap. Let's be real. Has nothing to do with what we're talking about. So That's it's a really just... weird one. <laughs> the Lord Mayor looks down. People shout up. Uh, let me go ahead and get a... Oh, no. My my goodness. He actually does say squashation. Squashation. Goodness. So I made two quick rolls for everyone. Oh, God. It's perceived that all the plants are coming. Oh, God. What? what why are you oh godding? I just looked up squashation. Um, oh, is that a real word? Yeah. Uh, Victoria, you are aware that squashation is a form of torture in which the victim's hands are tied together and raised above their head. The victim is then hung from the hands while a weight is suspended from the feet, causing intense pain to the arms and legs, often dislocating them. Oh, my oh, God. God. That's what that's called. Uh, I mean, the order oh. of the rack is here. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, so squashation really is the same thing that when they actually put you on the rack that happened to you, and mm. that they dislocate kind of, every yeah. every but it's different, yeah. like yeah. every ligament that comes. Yeah. Okay, wow. Instead of you know getting a horse to pull, they're just letting gravity do its work. Oh, which makes it slower, by the way. Nicolo, you glance up, watching as this goes down. Unlike the rest of the party, having rolled a successful perception check for sense motive. Oh. Oh. You realize that it does have nothing to do with anything else going on here. It is literally a calculated move meant to incite the crowd. Ah. Uh. As you think this, probably turning around towards the rest of the crowd, you see a young boy reach down, scoop up a handful of manure, and hurl it. Uh oh. The manure flies through the air, missing the Lord Mayor, although splashing against the wall next to him. It's oh. a good throw, kid. The mayor looks down, flicks his arm, although you don't actually think anything landed on him, although he did slightly spill his wine. Looks down at the crowd again. Very well. Enough of this. Gods, run them off, arrest them, or kill them. I don't care which. He then turns. The guards 
draw their blades. From the crowd, you see a dozen men throw back their cloaks, revealing red armbands as they reach down and pull truncheons from their side. Those and guys. I will need initiative from the party in part two. Oh. Da, 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 da. Oh, we're so ready. Squastation <laughs> yeah, yeah. for everyone. Ah. <laughs> so r- run them off or kill them. Or rest them. Whatever. It's whatever. Lovely. That's so great. Find the Path Ventures is an officially licensed partner of Paizo Incorporated. Hell's Rebels is copyright 2015. Hell's Rebels and the Pathfinder Adventure Path are trademarks of Paizo. All Pathfinder images are property of Paizo and are used with permission. Find the Path Ventures have converted Hell's Rebels from Pathfinder to Pathfinder 2nd Edition. Conversion notes are available to our Patreon backers at patreon.com backslash findthepath. <laughs>